Nine. The game is Baccarat. Bond looked round, but there was no possibility of being overheard, and the caviar would be waiting for the hot toast from the kitchens. Tell me. His eyes glittered with interest. They got the third Bulgar on the road to Paris. He was in a Citroën, and he had picked up two English hikers as protective coloring. At the roadblock, his French was so bad they asked for his papers, and he brought out a gun and shot one of the motorcycle patrol. But the other man got him, I don't know how, and managed to stop him committing suicide. Then they took him down to Rouen and extracted the story, in the usual French fashion, I suppose. Apparently, they were part of a pool held in France for this sort of job. Saboteurs, thugs, and so on. And Matisse's friends were already trying to round up the rest. They were going to get two million francs for killing you, and the agent who briefed them told them there was absolutely no chance of being caught if they followed his instructions exactly. She had to go with a sip of vodka. But this is the interesting part. The agent gave them the two camera cases you saw. He said the bright colors would make it easier for them. He told them that the blue case contained a very powerful smoke bomb. The red case was the explosive. As one of them threw the red case, the other was to press a switch on the blue case, and they would escape under the cover of the smoke. In fact, the smoke bomb was a pure invention to make the Bulgars think they could get away. Both cases contained an identical high-explosive bomb. There was no difference between the blue and red cases. The idea was to destroy you and the bomb throwers without trace. Presumably, there were other plans for dealing with the third man. Go on, said Bond, full of admiration for the ingenuity of the double cross. Well, apparently the Bulgars thought this sounded very fine, but cannily they decided to take no chances. It would be better, they thought, to touch off the smoke bomb first, and from inside the cloud of smoke, hurl the explosive bomb at you. What you saw was the assistant bomb thrower pressing down the lever on the phony smoke bomb, and, of course, they both went up together. The third Bulgar was waiting behind the Splendide to pick his two friends up. When he saw what had happened, he assumed they had bungled. But the police picked up some fragments of the unexploded red bomb, and he was confronted with them. When he saw that they had been tricked and that his two friends were meant to be murdered with you, he started to talk. I expect he's still talking now, but there's nothing to link all this with the chief. They were given the job by some intermediary, perhaps one of the chief's guards, and the chief's name means absolutely nothing to the one who survived. She finished her story just as the waiters arrived with the caviar, a mound of hot toast and small dishes containing finely chopped onion and grated hard-boiled egg, the white in one dish and the yolk in another. The caviar was heaped onto their plates, and they ate for a time in silence. After a while, Bond said, It's very satisfactory to be a corpse who changes place with his murderers. For them, it certainly was a case of being hoist with their own petard. But these must be very pleased with the day's work. Five of the opposition neutralized in 24 hours, and he told her of how the Munces had been confounded. Incidentally, he asked, how did you come to get mixed up in this affair? What section are you in? I'm personal assistant to head of S, said Vesper. As it was his plan, he wanted his section to have a hand in the operation, and he asked M if I could go. It seemed only to be a liaison job, so M said yes, although he told my chief that you would be furious at being given a woman to work with. She paused, and when Bond said nothing, continued. I had to meet Matisse in Paris and come down with him. I have a friend who is a vendeuse with Dior, and somehow she managed to borrow me this and the frock I was wearing this morning. Otherwise, I couldn't possibly have competed with all these people. She made a gesture towards the room. The office was very jealous, although they didn't know what the job was. All they knew was that I was to work with a double O. Of course, you're our heroes. I was enchanted. Bond frowned. It's not difficult to get a double O number if you're prepared to kill people, he said. That's all the meaning it has. It's nothing to be particularly proud of. I've got the corpses of a Japanese cipher expert in New York and a Norwegian double agent in Stockholm to thank for being a double O. Probably quite decent people. They just got caught up in the gale of the world like that Yugoslav that Tito bumped off. It's a confusing business, but if it's one's profession, one does what one's told. How do you like the grated egg with your caviar? It's a wonderful combination, she said. I'm loving my dinner. It seems a shame... She stopped, warned by a cold look in Bond's eye. If it wasn't for the job, we wouldn't be here, he said. Suddenly he regretted the intimacy of their dinner and of their talk. He felt as he had said too much, and what was only a working relationship had become confused. Let's consider what has to be done, he said, in a matter-of-fact voice. I'd better be explaining what I'm going to try and do and how you can help, which isn't very much, I'm afraid, he added. Now these are the basic facts. He proceeded to sketch out the plan and enumerate the various contingencies which faced them. The maître d'hôtel supervised the serving of the second course, and then as they ate the delicious food, Bond continued. She listened to him coldly, but with attentive obedience. She felt thoroughly deflated by his harshness, while admitting to herself that she should have paid more heed to the warning of Head of S. He's a dedicated man, her chief had said when he gave her the assignment. Don't imagine this is going to be any fun. He thinks of nothing but the job on hand, and while it's on, he's absolute hell to work for. But he's an expert, and there aren't many about, so you won't be wasting your time. He's a good-looking chap, but don't fall for him. I don't think he's got much heart. Anyway, good luck, and don't get hurt. All this had been something of a challenge, and she was pleased when she felt she attracted and interested him, as she knew intuitively that she did. 
Then at a hint that they were finding pleasure together, a hint that was only the first words of a conventional phrase, he had suddenly turned to ice and had brutally veered away as if warmth were poison to him. She felt hurt and foolish. Then she gave a mental shrug and concentrated with all her attention on what he was saying. She would not make the same mistake again. And the main hope is to pray for a run of luck for me, or against him. Bond was explaining just how Baccarat is played. It's much the same as any other gambling game. The odds against the banker and the player are more or less even. Only a run against either can be decisive and break the bank, or break the players. Tonight, the chief, we know, has bought the Baccarat Bank from the Egyptian syndicate which is running the high tables here. He paid a million francs for it, and his capital has been reduced to 24 million. I have about the same. There will be ten players, I expect, and we sit round the banker at a kidney-shaped table. Generally, this table is divided into two tableaux. The banker plays two games, one against each of the tableaux to the left and right of him. In the game, that banker should be able to win by playing off one tableau against the other, and by first-class accountancy. But there aren't enough Baccarat players yet at Royale, and Le Chief is going to pit his luck against the other players at a single tableau. It is unusual because the odds in favor of the banker aren't so good, but there are a shade in his favor, and of course, he has control of the size of the stakes. Well, the banker sits there in the middle with a croupier to rake in the cards and call the amount of each bank, and a chef de partie to umpire the game generally. I shall be sitting as near dead opposite the sheaf as I can get. In front of him, he has a shoe containing six packs of cards, well shuffled. There's absolutely no chance of tampering with the shoe. The cards are shuffled by the croupier and cut by one of the players and put into the shoe in full view of the table. We've checked on the staff and they're all okay. It would be useful, but almost impossible to mark all the cards, and it would mean the connivance of at least the croupier. Anyway, we shall be watching for that too. Bond drank some champagne and continued. Now what happens at the game is this. The banker announces an opening bank of 500,000 francs, of 500 pounds as it is now. Each seat is numbered from the right of the banker, and the player next to the banker, or number one, can accept this bet and push his money out onto the table, or pass it if it is too much for him or he doesn't want to take it. Then number two has the right to take it, and if he refuses, then number three, and so on round the table. If no single player takes it all, the bet is offered to the table as a whole, and everyone chips in, including sometimes the spectators around the table, until the 500,000 is made up. That is a small bet, which would immediately be met. But when it gets to a million or two, it's often hard to find a taker, or even, if the bank seems to be in luck, a group of takers to cover the bet. At the moment, I shall always try to step in and accept the bet. In fact, I shall attack Le Chief's bank whenever I get a chance, until either I've bust his bank or he's bust me. It may take some time, but in the end, one of us is bound to break the other, irrespective of the other players at the table, although they can, of course, make him richer or poorer in the meantime. Being the banker, he's got a slight advantage in the play, but knowing that I'm making a dead set at him, and not knowing, I hope, my capital, is bound to play on his nerves a bit, so I'm hoping that we start about equal. He paused while the strawberries came and the avocado pear. For a while, they ate in silence. Then they talked of other things while the coffee was served. They smoked. Neither of them drank brandy or liqueur. Finally, Bond felt it was time to explain the actual mechanics of the game. It's a simple affair, he said, and you'll understand it at once if you've ever played 21, where the object is to get cards from the banker which add up more closely to a count of 21 than his cards do. In this game, I get two cards and the banker gets two. And unless anyone wins outright, either or both of us can get one more card. The object of the game is to hold two or three cards, which together count nine points, or as nearly nine as possible. Court cards and tens count nothing. Aces, one each. Any other card is its face value. It is only the last figure of your count that signifies, so nine plus seven equals six, not sixteen. The winner is the one whose count is nearest to nine. Draws are played over again. Vesper listened attentively, but she also watched the look of abstract passion on Bond's face. Now, Bond continued, when the banker deals me my two cards, if they add up to eight or nine, they're unnatural, and I turn them up and I win, unless he has an equal or better natural. If I haven't got a natural, I can stand on a seven or a six. Perhaps ask for a card or perhaps not on a five, and certainly ask for a card if my count is lower than five. Five is the turning point of the game. According to the odds, the chances of bettering or worsening your hand if you hold a five are exactly even. Only when I ask for a card or tap mine to signify that I stand on what I have can the banker look at his. If he has a natural, he turns them up and wins. Otherwise, he is faced with the same problem as I was, but he has helped in his decision to draw or to not draw a third card by my actions. If I have stood, he must assume I have a 5, 6, or 7. If I have drawn, he will know that I have something less than a 6, and that I may have improved my hand or not with the card he gave me, and this card was dealt to me face up. On its face value and the knowledge of the odds, he will know whether to take another card or to stand on his own. So he has a very slight advantage over me. He has a tiny help over his decision to draw or to stand, but there is always one problem card at this game. Shall one draw or stand on a 5? And what will your opponent do with a 5? Some players always draw or always stand. I follow my intuition. But in the end, Bond stubbed out his cigarette and called for the bill. It's the natural 8s and 9s that matter, and I must just see that I get more of them than he does.